Hey guys, welcome to that Pedal Show VCQ. Dan here. Dave here, hello. <laughs> so, um, again, my very good friend Mr. Dave Gregory has come in today uh, because the shows we had this week, or two shows, we had my vlog on my practice rig and of course our 12 string episode with the wonderful Mr. Dave Gregory. Mick is not here today, he is with his wife uh, in Greece. They've gone over to plant a tree for Catherine's dad. So we're sending them lots of love. Mm. And uh, but he'll be back here again this week, and then it'll be business as usual. Um, so on to the comments and questions. I'll just quickly go through um, my practice vlog. So many of you had many positive things to say about that. I was really touched, including uh, Chris Ebner, Tony Syrett, Chris Tain, William Sanderson, Matthew Standing, David Cyril, and uh, many others um, who loved the both both the amps, the THR10 and the Audio Kitchen. Um, Sergio Rodriguez said the big tree sounded so amazing I really understand how a great amp can help improve your playing. When I got my Cornell Plexi 7, also a beautiful handmade single ended EL84 amp, EL amplifier, uh, I understood how I needed to practice to sound good on that amp because every note that was not played properly stood out. So that is that concept of having an amp that has so much detail yeah. that it can actually make you a better player. It certainly concentrates the mind when the, yeah. you can hear all those fluffs. There you go, there you go. So that's what that was basically about, and we are going to get into more of that in that vlog series. Panos Sakos says, this series looks very promising. A topic that would be interesting is how do you plan your practice? What aspects of your guitar playing do you want to improve, and how do you come up with the exercises that you need to execute in order to improve yourself? Ah. That's a that's a very very uh, educated and professional question. It is. It most is. of us just think, oh, I really need to just uh, whack something at the moment. Where's that guitar? <laughs> bash, bash, yeah, bash. Yeah. Ah, that feels better. Yeah. I'll go and have a, have a cup of tea. No, uh, it's just, that's very good discipline, but it, it's a tricky one to answer because it's going to be different for everybody. I yeah, imagine, yeah, yeah. Bearing in mind what, what their circumstances are at home and when they have time to spare. Although you shouldn't really have time to spare, you should dedicate time. And, there you uh, go, so that's great. nominate an hour of the day yeah, yeah. at some point when you don't have family pressures or any other distractions. Well, Khalil Aid Southpaw says, how in your words do you go from being a pretty good guitar player to an excellent guitar player? And this is coming from someone who is focused more on songwriting and developing feel style rather than technical guitar playing. I don't know any excellent guitar players who would ever call themselves an excellent guitar player. Yeah. One. Uh, for me, I think that right, the more you know, the more you realise there is to know. And as long as you're happy to do that and carry on, <laughs> then yeah. you'll make progress, you know, and just don't be daunted That's it. when you You've got to maintain the passion and uh, and the interest. As long as that's there, you will improve. If you because you'll just uh, find your way to the guitar without any effort or help at all. You yeah, know, that's uh, that's your safe place. Goldmore one says um, regarding my playing in the show. He says uh, this might be hopelessly off topic, off topic, but your playing sounds so much more relaxed and is a lot more fluid than how I hear you playing TPS shows. The, the TPS shows that we do are about finding sounds and that sort of thing. This show is specifically dedicated to um, chords and uh, harmony and, and, and playing. And doing these shows, I'm using rigs that I've built that I'm really comfortable with. When we do a, a normal pedal show, most of the gear I've never played before. And I'm finding my way around that. And finally, two plus two is chicken says, five minutes to practice, it takes me that long to, that long to tune the guitar. Um, if you have a really busy life, and this is one of the things about having those two practice rigs. So I've got a little um, Yamaha, similar to your little Fender Sol State that you have in the lounge room, that if you've got a couple of minutes to plug in, it's really easy, it takes no effort, yeah. and in seconds, you're playing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't always have an hour every day. You know, if I get, if I can structure a half hour practice, I'll sit down with the, the big trees, um, which is my little valve amp, and set up some pedals and do it like that. But if I've got five minutes, I have my little um, the Yamaha amplifier and I plug in and within seconds I'm playing. Mm -hmm. And that five minutes can be valuable, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. it's that sort of thing is about convenience. Um, and if you've got a spare five minutes, spend it practicing. It's, it's, you know, it's great. Okay, but on to the main event was this week's video um, with the one I named Mr. Gregory. Uh, and there was so much love 
for you in this show. Mike Aurea says, this is the best TPS ever. Um, the way Dan always lights up when Mr. Dave Gregory is mentioned in the past battle shows, I knew one day would, this, this day would come, and I sure have enjoyed every moment um, of having Dave's interview and him walking through those rookies. Uh, Mark Desling says, TPS has officially ascended from one of the best guitar shows on YouTube to the best guitar on YouTube. On YouTube. Uh, Dave Gregory has been my hero for decades, and it was glorious to watch him on the show. And uh, my friend Andrew Morgan, um, who I met in Japan last time we were out there last year, he said the same as you, Dan, as we chatted in Tokyo. XTC got me through high school and beyond. Thanks for getting Dave on the hot seat. Uh, this was flashbacks to heaven for me. Oh, great. Which is great. And I think uh, David M. Sun uh, summed it up when he says, Bless you, Dave. I'm not sure even you know how much of an influence you are to so many of us. Thank you, TPS. Well, thank you so much. I'm... I'm... Well, overcome with embarrassment at this point. <laughs> thank you. It's lovely, it's lovely, lovely comments, and uh, it was real fun chatting to you guys. Because I have to be honest, I've, after ten minutes, I forgot there was even a camera in the room. Oh, we were just good. three mates chatting away and talking, you know, geek talk. That's the nitrous oxide we released slowly <laughs> into the room. But, you know, and I knew it'd be fascinating. So as soon as we had the inkling to get a twelve-string episode, I thought we have to get David to do this. It'll be just awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. One of the things with the when we got the Dan Electro twelve in and it is such a great sound that and is. and it brings different things out of you yeah that's true you know? that certainly does and is it and it, but again it's a different discipline you know and when i think of the all the 12 string stuff that you did on not just the xdc stuff but our records and you're you're in a different mindset when you pick up that instrument sure you know and you because you're it's a uh it's a different texture that you're creating you know. And you, you play in a different style as well. Like I, I said in the um, in the program, you, you tend not to be bending strings. You right. Know, in fact, you wouldn't want to bend strings. It's more uh, it's it's more of a rhythm thing. It's just great for strumming. Yeah. Right. I love to just strum a twelve string. Mark the Spark says I just paused and listened to Real by Real remastered and then live in Paris in 1979. Uh, Dave was a genius. What a great live band XTC was. He says I was too young. What a legend to have him playing in a band with you, Dan. Yeah, I mean, that was, it was a surreal experience. I, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know the story, um, I was a massive XTC fan growing up. I met my wife actually playing an XTC song in a venue in Sydney, and because she is from Swindon. Uh, so we ended up back in Swindon, met Dave, um, and... Then and we, we had formed new, a band. Yeah, we formed a band, and it was it was yeah it was it was incredible. Yeah. You know, I say if you can be in a band with your hero, do it because it's awesome. Um, so, uh, Matt Plum, he says, I'm I'm excited to say that I am uh, number two hundred and fifty three on Tin Spirit's fo Spotify followers, <laughs> and he said there's a Vi sound to some of the solos. Was that on purpose? Oh wow! Well, Steve Vi, well, he's I, no, I'm not in his league. He still manages to sound musical, yeah. even with all the technical stuff between sure. his uh, fingers and the amplifier. Mm. Uh, what a phenomenal player he is. Yeah. To be even mentioned in the same breath as him is quite flattering. So um, thank you very much, <laughs> whoever made that comparison. But I didn't set out consciously to copy him. I, I never could. But there's a little bit of kind of fretboard tapping and shredding at the start of the solo on one of the songs on, um, uh, you, you know, the big hit down, what was it called? At Summer, Summer Now. Well, funnily enough, Revenant just says he ha how much he loves the song Summer Now. Um, yeah, there's the solo in that, I think, is a, a wonderful example of how what you do serves the song. I mean, that's the first thing I noticed about your guitar playing. When you hear a guitar player who really serves the song in his playing, and it doesn't mean that you can't be virtuosic. Um, you know, uh, Real by Real is a great example. Um, I love the solo in Supergirl. It's another great example. Just It's eight bars of just sheer joy. And it is virtuosic, but it, it serves the song. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it all comes down to the song at the end of the day, it's mm. always about, it's all, for me anyway, um, I find, I'll be perfectly frank, most brilliant players, brilliant as they are, guitar players who make solo records, solo instrumental records, are really dull. <laughs> and I just can yeah, count I on the mean. fingers of one hand uh, 
I mean, Jeff Beck, I would say he's made some good. Yeah, yeah. He's a, one of the few players who uh, who's made a few really good. But he's continuously interesting, isn't he? He really is. Yeah, yeah sort of reinvents himself at, at his yeah. age and everything. Yeah, I mean, amazing. he is the most amazing musician. But most of these fantastic players, because they're not songwriters initially, you know, that's not mm. their, their forte. It's just uh, a bunch of rather tiresome, uh, uninspired soloing and uh, weak melodies and, sure. you know, the production line production. Uh, Caesar Chalbo says it's a great episode. Uh, how and why did Tense Spirits end? Um, we had been going for 10 years. We'd done two albums. We're working on the third album. It got to a point that everyone was so busy. That's and it. There was, it was taking us such a crazy amount of time to get anywhere near being able to present something for a, a third album. Mm. Um, but it's one of those things, all good things, you know? Yeah. And it was, you know. I'm very pleased with those two records. We've, yeah, I've man, they're we, great. Uh, that, you know, and I've spoken to a lot of people since. Oh, you guys, what do you mean you've broken up? The, you you guys are great, <laughs> this kind of thing, you know, which they always say after the things got dead and buried, mm. they uh, suddenly um, with a great lost hope. But uh, no, it was a good band. Yeah, it was and great we fun. we had a lot of fun. Yeah, it was, and, yeah. And made some good friends. We uh, did. We, we got, formed a strong friendship yeah. before all of us. Actually, to, you know, and to that end, I want to say a massive thank you to Rob Crossland, yeah. uh, who was always such a great friend to us. Um, also to Steve Rothery. So oh, yes. we, uh, w you know, in the early days of Ten Spirits, just after the first album, we supported um, Marillion at their convention in Port Zealand in, in Holland. Holland. Yes. And and they had us do a couple of sh other shows with them, and yeah. they were so great and so yeah. supportive to us, and we got you know a lot of fans from from those guys. So you know, and to everyone that came out and saw Ten Spirits kick and everything, we're you know really grateful. So. But yeah, it was it was so much fun. There was, there are some songs that we had um, basically written, you know, and you know who knows we, we might get some time in the future to, to get those done and put it out with a, a you know a, a remixed version of the first yeah. album. Who knows? Anything can happen. But um, yeah, all all good bands eventually come to Netflix for one well, good the, reason. The sad or part is that um, bands that don't work. Break up. Yeah, yeah. They just do. Uh, it's not many people that can just keep a hobby going forever and ever. And uh, uh, you, you, you know, you have to be determined. It might make it a priority really yeah, to, to, sure. get, to get, get anywhere at all. Yeah. And you know, it was difficult for us to tour as well because oh, we, yes. you know, we had went to Japan, did some shows over there, which was awesome, yeah. and a few bits and pieces. But because everyone here is, well, everyone was in the band was so busy. Getting a string of dates together was nigh impossible. So there you go. Just the, the same reasons that any other, you know, band would break up. Um, okay, Sordell says it's a great interview, very industry. But for the love of God, do a follow up where Dave talks about his work with Big Big Train. Ah yes, those guys. Those guys. Mm -hmm. So you've just released another album. Yes, then uh, that came out last Friday, the seventeenth, and um, it's called it's called Grand Tour, and it's a seventy five minute. Uh, well, epic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of. Uh, it was a lot of work. It took a, you know, it took up a lot of time. Some fantastic playing on it from uh, from everybody. Really, mm. uh, it's uh, it's very accomplished. It's our best sounding album to my ears. I think Rob Aubrey has done a brilliant job in getting everything sounding just so. Uh, mm. it's, it's better sounding than some that some of our previous ones. Not that there was anything bad with them, but. You know, I'll always want a remix. No, that's just me. <laughs> Johnny Rowland says, I really hope there's a shout out for Dave's other band, Big Big Train, um, especially as I've got a new album out today, which was last Friday. Mm -hmm. um, also, Dan, didn't you play on one of their albums? Uh, yeah, I did. You did? Yeah, I did, back in the early days. Yes. We had, um, there was a solo I did on, not, was it Hedgerow? We did a little bit of dual guitar on Hedgerow. Yes. Uh, and then I think you played something on uh, Winchester from St Giles. That's Hill, right. That's right. Yeah. Which was on the Underfall Yard, was it, or was it the following one? No, it was the, the following one. one. English yeah. Electric. Dave must come back with the SG. This is from from U two, spelt E W E T 
T-O-O. Uh, Dave must come back with the SG. I love all his guitars in history, uh, but I don't think I do much with a Ricky. It's such a specific sound. Yeah, it is a specific sound, oh, yeah. but it's wonderful. Now, the SG, um, this is the guitar that we're talking about that you loaned to Pierre oh, Mike Keneally. Mike Keneally. Yeah. So you brought that with you today, right? Yeah, here it is. Okay. It's going to be, it's always been one of my favourite of, of all my guitars because it was the first Gibson guitar I ever bought. And wow. uh, we're going back now to November 1972, before most of you were born, I suspect. I just went, wandered into um, John Holmes' music shop in Swindon uh, one wow. Saturday, and there were these guys doing a deal with, the, they brought this guitar in and they, they didn't like it. I can't imagine why not, but they didn't. They wanted a, a jazz guitar that, that they had in the window there. It's the Eric Clapton SG, which is the one that I'd always lusted after ever since, you know, I saw the, the Painted Fool one. The, and a side note to that, you actually I used actually the, the Painted Fool guitar. To play that, that was the, that was the so, yeah, right. That was the solo on Supergirl, is that yes, right? Yeah, that's really super, Supergirl. Um, but that's a separate story in itself. Right. Anyway, I, I always loved the, uh, everything about this particular, this is the version two of, uh, you know, when the SGs were first introduced in 1961, they were called Les Pauls, which was a, you've got one? I've got. So, there. SG shape, Les Paul Les on the Paul, headstock. Yes, that's right. Although the standard, would have had this inlay, right. and Les Paul would have been etched into ah, the truss. Ah, okay, right. Just on the standard, but the juniors, not the specials. For some reason, the, they didn't consider the Les Paul special, which is, had the two P90s on mm -hmm. it. Uh, that never got a silk screen on the headstock for some reason. Nobody knows why. Wow. This is 61. That's a 61, so yep. that's first year of issue. Right. And I should say that is a fantastic guitar. That is so the best good. SG I've ever played. And uh, you found this for me. I did. <laughs> you were lucky right. there, Dan. Oh, very lucky. The favours I do for you, man. <laughs> so this, we don't have anything. There's nothing on the on the truss rod cover. It just says Gibson. That's right. And the original Les Pauls would have had this little thistle inlay, mm -hmm. and Les Paul would have been etched into the truss rod right. cover. Right. And the custom had a very much more. Uh, I've got a. I've got a custom. I should have brought it along, but I, I didn't know we were going to talk SGs today, so it's at home. That had a, a very different looking headstock as well. It was much more ornamented. Had a lot more pearl in it. And, mm. uh, anyway, but that's by the by. Anyway, these were soon rebranded SGs after Les Paul's contract with Gibson expired. Right. And he didn't like this guitar at all. He. Uh, he thought it was uh, it wasn't his idea of an electric guitar. You, uh, you as you can imagine, he was more of a jazz yeah, band right. player. Yeah. He didn't really care for this. Which Les Pauls do sound great for jazz on the neck pickup. Oh yes, you know, they yes they be, do. Yeah, but the um, if the SG was too rock and roll, it was way too modern. It was mm. all spiky and everything. You could get to the top frets though without having to, you know, find your way around that big chunk of wood. That yeah, right. I always loved this. I loved the cherry lacquer mm. and I loved the the way it, the, the cherries set off against the nickel plating and the black pick guard and the crown inlays. And what everything. is this? This is a 65. Right. So they've been... It's retained as cherry. Beautiful. This one has, yeah. Now, the, um, the early ones, and yours has retained its cherry, because most of the 61s turn brown. Brown, yeah, yeah. Well, this has been its case most of its well, life. Well, that's it. Yeah. That's the, that's, that's the thing. It was, it's always the ultraviolet that does the damage. Right. And it took a few years for Gibson to realise that they had a problem. Right. As soon as they did, uh, they changed the, something something in the um, in the compound of the, of the lacquers, mm -hmm. and most of the ones after about 63 will retain their, their oh wow color. okay as long as they're not exposed to you know not hanging on people's walls or sure. in shop windows yeah yeah general. right so yes this was the the guitar that mike Keneally used when he came over yes plugged into your matchless that just right. proceeded to just rule everything for that <laughs> night actually there's some clips on youtube if you search for that mike mike Keneally plays riffs at swindon yeah and it's astonishing yeah, yeah. um Okay, uh, Doc Tiberius says, well, I came to watch Dave Gregory's 12-string, but 
OMG, the tone of that 335 and its history, amazing. Mm. That is the most astounding 335. And the, the interesting thing about it is that I, I've always found with that guitar, there's a, there's a cut that that guitar has, even on the neck pickup, mm. that a lot of 335s, when you get to that neck pickup, become woolly mm. and, and big, yeah. but they, they don't have the sort of slice that that guitar has. Yeah. It's a fascinating thing. Yeah. Original paths in that? They, they aren't actually, they, as far as I'm aware, the pickups are original. They don't have PAF stickers. Right. They've got uh, patent number stickers. Uh, according to Walter Carter, who was working at the Gibson Library at the time, it was shipped in April 1963. So that all kind of uh, ties in with the, um, I mean, basically it's the same humbucking pickup. Sure. Certainly the uh, resistance readings are consistent with what I would expect to find. Right. Between seven and a half and eight, eight and a quarter, I think, eight and a quarter K. Um, and it sounds like uh, like an old Gibson, oh, which is... Astonishing, astonishing sound thing. thing. Yeah. Finally, Andy Yates, Guitar Ted, Robert Brown, Fear All You Hear, Whisper Thief, and about 28 others says, put me down for a pre-ordered treble bastard. <laughs> <laughs> TM. Yeah, what a... What a uh, what amazes me with a pedal like that, because I've got like a dozen treble booster clones using the same transistors and things, mm -hmm. but there's, when you hear, I don't know what it is, but there's something about the original ones, whether the way they were matched at the, at the factory or whatever, they had a special um, prerequisite for the, the gain and things of the transistors, I don't know, but... Well, I, that one I, that you have is specific. Is a very special sounding booster. It, it is, and I've looked online uh, at, at some of these, you know, on the image bank for the Range Master Travel Booster. If you've ever been there and had a look, they, they're all different. Yeah, yeah, and they're Every, using they're using sort of stuff they find. Yep. Whatever it happens to be. A whole bunch of different transistors and things in them as well. Yeah, yeah so yeah. interesting. So yeah, they would have all sounded different. Um, as different as the ones, I guess, that are made today, but well, it's wonderful that, uh, it's sounding thing. It's the magical OC44 transistor. Right. It's that one component mm -hmm. is the most important thing. I know there's another one uh, that they, they also used on, in some of them. Uh, I can't remember the exact number of it. NKT? NK is, yeah, it, be, it could be. I don't mm. know. Don't, you know about this stuff. Yeah. Well, the, the, I, I have an OC44 one, which is my Keeley Java Boost. They use that transistor. Yeah, find a good one of those, yeah. and you're away. That's it. Yeah. But remember, it won't make you sound like Brian May. <laughs> they, yeah, right. Um, and especially, a lot of people mentioned the Matchless Amp as well. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, we should, have, we should have featured the Matchless Amp, because yeah. that's... Uh, it's just, I've had now, what's 25 years, mm. I think? I've never changed a single tube in it, and it still sounds as good today as it did when I first got it's it. magic sound effect. And what's the speaker? That's the, the matchless... It's a single matchless... Um, actually, it's a, it's a variant on a Celestian... Uh, vintage 30? Vintage 30. Yeah. And they've matchless it up. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, you know, if I have to record uh, any amplifier, that even if it's not the matchless, if, say, I've got a, a, few, a couple of Fender piggybacks, mm -hmm. or even that Marshall 50, mm. I can put that through the matchless cab, and that will improve the sound. Wow. End. There's something in that speaker that's uh, that, that added extra. I'm, I'm I say quiet. Yeah, yeah. I'm now, because there was a time that we were both using matchless amplifiers, and I, I had one with reverb, which was great, but I'm thinking, I'm now thinking of just finding one just like yours, no reverb, just the two channels. Mm -hmm. And what I love about the matchless is, Normally with two channel amplifiers, you have a clean channel, which can be good, and the dirty channel, the clean channel is normally too clean, the dirty channel is normally too dirty, yeah. right? Yeah. But the the EF86 channel on the matchless, which I've also got in my AC30, mm. and it just adds a hair more gain, a hair more mid focus. It's not a world apart, no. you know, from the two, the two channels. Right. And, but there's a, 
There's just a, a, an element of when you need the extra punch and stuff, it's there. It's not this. It's not like you're kicking a distortion pedal no, in. That's right. You know, no, no, it's subtle and it's just to give you that extra little um, that little gain stage necessary to uh, or just to strut out with a solo. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, it just adds the rock and roll to whatever it is you do. Sure it does. Adds a bit of rock and roll. Brilliant. Mate, thank you so much for coming and doing oh, this it's today. A pleasure, and uh, again, sending Mick and Catherine lots of love. Yeah. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye.